my name is Lauren. I'm the social media coordinator at the Humane League UK and I'm very excited to be speaking to you today about creating inclusive social media spaces and befriending all different types of so-called haters. So what should you expect from this session? We are going to cover the importance of a step-by-step -step approach. Who are these haters and how do we respond to them? The need for inclusion, mental well-being for social media users and moderators, and the evidence behind compassionate communication. But before we get stuck in, I would like to start with a little anecdote um, to give you the backdrop of how I've ended up here today. I grew up loving a debate and I thought I could use my love of persuasive communication to do some good in the world. This thought process led me to studying law at university where I definitely exercised the argumentative part of the bargain a lot, but not so much of the doing good. 2016 took my love of debate to a whole new level though. This was the year I became vegan. And if I thought that I'd been a passionate debater before, oh, I was, I was sorely mistaken. Going vegan, I felt like a fire had been lit inside of me. I was filled with this unending energy and conviction that I had to share how important animal rights were. I had to make others see the truth. I had to use my voice as much as I possibly could. And so to non-vegans, I might have seemed like a bit of a hater, bashing their lifestyle choices at every opportunity. I remember how I used to spend hours responding to anti-vegan comments on articles I saw on Facebook. And I remember just feeling so drained by all of this. I was really burning myself out. One day, my friends and I were protesting a social event at Bristol Zoo, and we were met with disinterest and a sort of bemused disdain by the event goers. I don't think that they cared for the loud, annoying vegans trying to put a downer on their night. And while I didn't care about being annoying, I realised I did care about being effective. When I started working for a vegan news site, I calmed down a bit. I learned how to harness my passion into softer words, words that a meat eater, a novice to animal welfare, could empathise with. I didn't want to start an argument anymore. I wanted to create open, productive dialogues. And so I became a more effective communicator. At the Humane League UK, we strive to be relentless, nimble and innovative in our approach, but our voice is also empowering and welcoming. We are deeply committed to growing the animal protection movement, inclusively inviting new people to join our communities and become activists for the animals. Our positive, friendly and open-minded nature makes us easily approachable. And this is what I want to talk to you about the importance of today. So I have a question for everybody here. How many of you were born vegan? Now, I can't see everyone, but I'm imagining that almost all of us were not born vegan or even vegetarian. For most of us, veganism is a new concept that we're introduced to at some point in our lives. We educate ourselves, we reflect on our former choices and habits, and we make a conscious decision to change. I don't know about anyone else, but before I went vegan, I definitely thought it was a bit, um, a bit extreme. And I'm sure I'm not the only person here who might have had that impression, much as I might have changed my mind now. So I was a flexitarian for a few months beforehand and vegetarian for two months, but it was only when two friends went vegan, started cooking plant-based meals for me, encouraging me to watch documentaries with them um, and really having discussions with me that I opened up and I understood that there was a better alternative to my meat to veg carb meals. An incremental approach definitely worked with me. All social justice movements have been a journey of incremental changes. 
when women in England got the vote in 1918, only some women benefited. But in 1928, the vote was extended. Since then, numerous small but meaningful policies and changes have continued to improve the lives of women. And our current fourth wave feminism is testament to this continuing evolution of progress. In our movement, step-by-step -step changes, such as starting with improved welfare, are a necessary path for the world to stop treating animals as products put on this earth to make a profit from. So let me make an analogy. Free range eggs, yeah, they might not be the ideal, but they're definitely better than caged conditions. A veg curious meat eater, sure, they might still be contributing to animal suffering, but there is undeniably more possibility there for change than someone who is completely disinterested. So you might be wondering what on earth this has got to do with communication. Well, to communicate well and persuade people of your argument, you must be able to see where the other person is coming from. Meet people where they're at and then you can guide them forward. When audiences engage with your posts on social media, there is such useful insight into their interests and how we can appeal to them more. Supporter journeys are essential considerations in effective comms, and this requires knowing where the starting point is. For example, a traditional supporter journey may look like someone sees an ad for the Humane League UK on their Facebook timeline. They like the page and we educate them on our message and mission. They become more engaged and begin liking and commenting on posts. They may sign up to our newsletter, becoming an important part of our target audience. They then become even more aware of our campaigns and are prepared to donate when we launch a fundraising appeal. So if we know that supporter journeys are so important in meeting engagement, sign up and donation goals, then we must also acknowledge that incremental steps and an upward learning curve are also really important when it comes to people's dietary and lifestyle choices. This understanding should permeate our communications, including when it comes to the haters. So, who actually are the haters, right? The Oxford Dictionary unhelpfully defines a hater as a person who hates somebody or something, or a person who is very negative or critical in their attitudes. It's, it's pretty vague. Um, the definitely less professional but somewhat helpful Urban Dictionary did define what it means when we use the term hate is gonna hate though. It's a colloquial saying, meaning that people who don't like you will always find a way, a reason to dislike you, no matter how unsupported that reason may be. Hmm. So really, anyone can be a hater. We must consider that perspective is everything. And to some people, people working in animal rights might seem like a hater, whereas to vegans, avid meat eaters might seem like haters. Maybe the point is that no one is ever really a hater, but merely people trying to figure out new ideas and where they fit into the equation. Some examples. Meet Phil, the pescatarian. Phil loves his pet dogs, Petey and Piper, more than anything. And he supports charities who help rehome abandoned dogs. When Phil learnt how intelligent cows are, he decided to give up beef. And in time, he dropped chickens, pigs, and other land animals from his plate. Phil loves to see us post inspirational articles, veggie recipes, and cute animal images. And he even responds with broken heart emojis when we post content about animals suffering and in need of help. However, Phil feels both confused and defensive when we post fish-related content. He thinks that fish is a healthy and sustainable alternative to the beef he's given up, and he accuses us of fabricating facts to pull on people's heartstrings. I'll give you a moment here to read Phil's comment.
so this example brings me to a point of stressing one how important it is to make sure anything you say in your comms is fully backed up so that if you are accused of spreading misinformation you can point to a reliable source and two we know that our messaging might fall on reluctant ears and that's another reason it's so important to make our comms as empathetic as possible so what's our approach politeness education and encouragement we say hi phil sorry to hear you feel this way it's not our intention to guilt trip rather we are keen to share the growing body of scientific studies showing that fish do despite common misconception experience pain form bonds and yes feel you can find out more on this here with a link to our website with fisheries over depleted there's also growing concern that sustainable fishing is a thing of the past and luckily we can now get all the nutrients we need without risks of mercury for example by eating plant-based We find it's really helpful to refer people like Phil to sources for them to explore themselves. This both removes the burden from whoever is moderating comments and also allows you to share more information than is suitable to respond in a comment. Uh, this is also a really prime example of how easy it is to upset supporters if you feel if they feel like you're shaming them for their lifestyle choices. However, I am pleased to say that in this example, Phil actually apologised on the post for any upset that he might have caused and engaged with other followers in a more progressive, open dialogue. It turned out to be a meeting of minds rather than an unresolved trolling. So now we meet Maureen, the meat eater. Maureen grew up in an area where farming drives the local economy and believes that it's natural to eat animal products. She's skeptical of plant-based products and views them as a threat to the life she's comfortable with. When we share a Fun Fact Friday graphic with cool facts about pigs, Maureen may respond by saying that she loves bacon. Some might describe Maureen as a that they can though troll. And everyone has a Maureen in their lives, right? So how do we respond? I would politely empathize that people might not want to give up their favorite foods and recommend some plant-based bacon options to Maureen. Here's an example of how I would respond. So I think it's important to stress that we wouldn't spend too much time continuing conversation here. And we do think there are instances where responding will only fuel conflict. But we do think that replying once with a kind of friendly, informative reply um, both creates an inviting atmosphere, while maybe, just maybe, opening Maureen's eyes to a new possibility. So you might be questioning the usefulness of responding to someone like Maureen at all. Maybe you think Maureen simply won't have her eyes opened to a new way of life. And that's definitely a fair concern. But even if you think that Maureen is somewhat of a lost cause, think about how others on your page might view this. If someone else sees these bacon comments, they may feel upset, they may feel amused, they may even feel disappointed that we allowed this kind of comment on our page. By replying, it shows whoever may see it that we are firm in defending and furthering our mission and are willing to tackle all obstacles to it, bacon lovers included. 
building an online community means considering how each each post each interaction each comment sets an example for how open we are for discussion and plays into the broad impression people get of our page and what about ashley the animal rights activist ashley went vegan a few months ago after watching land of hope and glory they have thrown themselves into the movement they boycott anywhere serving animal products share memes on Instagram, shaming meat eaters, and send us direct messages expressing the view that welfare is the enemy of veganism. They say that we're holding hands with murderers. Sometimes Ashley's comments are emotionally charged and sometimes explicit. With Ashley, we are cautious that we won't allow hateful speech or shaming of other supporters on our pages. We have filters set up on our channels to block any profane, offensive language and moderate daily to keep an eye on comments. However, up to a certain point and on the basis that we aren't fueling aggression, we are willing to explain our stance. Personally, I fully understand that when someone is so passionate about a cause, as I imagine we all are here, that we can be driven by emotions and we react rather than respond. So we're happy to try and meet people like Ashley where they are without compromising on our voice, our mission and our values. Here's an example for you. As an organisation that works to improve welfare, we're prone to criticism from abolitionists like Ashley. When questioned about our approach, we'll explain it, try and communicate the logic behind it, Here's an example of a typical response we might send. I'll give you a minute to read this interaction. Okay. However, if the conversation continues with no real progress, but becomes the standstill of opinions, we would politely end the conversation. So for example, we might say, we respect your view and appreciate the work you do for the animals, but it seems like we're not going to be able to agree on this issue. Thank you for your questions and feel free to check out our website for more information. Of course, we want people to understand and support our mission, but where conversation isn't productive, it isn't a good use of my energy and time, which could be better spent making other progress for the animals. I should also mention that it often isn't just one person like Ashley leaving comments like this. When one person leaves a negative comment, it can attract a host of others keen to put their two cents into the conversation. This recently occurred on our page when we announced that major UK pastry chain Greg's had signed up to the Better Chicken Commitment. Initially, we received one critical comment on our post, which I decided didn't warrant a reply. My feeling with this particular post was that the individual wasn't open to nor seeking discussion. The following comment was one I was far more willing to engage with. It appeared curious, honest and open to dialogue. However, after two replies where I empathised, explained the BCC and our stance, this individual proceeded to keep commenting even once I had ceased to reply. As a general rule, which of course may change depending on the situation, I would say that two replies is sufficient. Often one to address any questions and one to reiterate our stance and direct adversaries to our website or other sources. So general rule, two replies. Even though here I had laid out our reasoning, the critics, they just kept on coming. Now I'm sure 
many of you here might have had the pleasure of receiving comments such as these. People really can get on the trolling hype, I think, sometimes. And um, yeah, these ones were particularly impassioned, as you can see. In this instance, I decided that there was no value to be had from responding. I'd already set out our response, which they could see in the comments. So further replies to each individual would only have meant repeating myself. Secondly, there is a bit of a risk of it becoming a barrage of criticism. All of the adversaries versus me, just one person sitting behind the screen. Anyone here who works as a moderator, I'm sure can relate to that feeling of being sort of ganged up on. And don't worry, I am going to talk a little bit about ways we can get around this later in the session. But even so, mob mentality is a really unpleasant thing, which can occur not just in physical groups of people, but on social media too. If it starts to feel like, for lack of a better phrase, critics are joining forces against you, it may be best to just not engage at all and not give them further ammunition. It's unlikely that you'd be able to effectively forge a productive dialogue when this happens and can become a waste of your energy and resources. So when thinking about engaging with critics, I would recommend always asking yourself the questions, is this person or people open to productive dialogue? So using Maureen as an example, Am I going to convince her to support a welfare charity? Or if the answer to the above is no, consider whether a positive outcome can be gained for the wider mission or supporter base. Oh, sorry, I've actually skipped over a question there. Is a positive outcome, are they open to productive dialogue and is a positive outcome likely? Yeah, so that's where the more an example comes in. And then if the answer to these is no, you, you can question whether a positive outcome for our general supporters or mission is likely. So if I reply to a critic who is disinterested, will it benefit our other followers to see my response like we discussed with Maureen? And if not, the comment is probably not worth replying to. There is unfortunately another instance where the so-called haters might come in and it's something we've experienced more recently. All of my previous examples revolve around scepticism of our vegan mission but what about when people only care about this cause? After the death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade and so many others, the Humane League UK, like so many of us, was reminded of the systematic racism rife in our societies and organisations. We've since been doing a lot of internal work to assess how we can become better allies. And one of those ways was to join a charity coalition to address hate speech online. When we shared a statement about this on social media, a couple of people, they weren't too happy. So here, what you can see is an example of someone reacting quite emotionally to our announcement. We were told that we'd lost this person's admiration, support, and everybody on our page was able to see this individual purporting for the need for more hate speech. While it has to be said that the point of our announcement was slightly misconceived here, it was a tricky one to respond to nonetheless. This person expressed dislike of not only our organisation, but specific members of society like wildlife hunters. We didn't want to apologise for our stance, which we knew we stood by, but wanted to recognise this person's concerns and confusion. It can be really difficult to strike a balance between apologetic and kind. Do we want to apologise for supporting something we believe is necessary? Definitely, definitely not. But do we want to ostracise someone who is missing the point? Ideally not either. This is an example of when it can feel helpful to direct someone to educational resources, to be polite to them, 
but also to remain firm and convicted in what you're saying. I'll give you a moment to scan over that reply. It feels relevant at this point to touch on the need for us collectively to really recognise the societal issues that we face and how these play out on social media. Of course, our pl platforms are not the primary places to be discussing other movements, whether it's Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ plus issues or anything else. And we do have to keep doing the, the work that we do for the animals. But at the Humane League UK, we are of the opinion that we have a duty to use our position to amplify other important causes, to publicly show our support, to internally implement that, and to make our social media platforms as safe a space for all members of society as possible. For us, a more inclusive movement is a stronger movement for the animals and people alike. This brings me onto the topic of mental well-being and social media and the, how the way that we communicate on these platforms really can make all the difference. I am sure that most of us have heard or even unfortunately experienced that social media use can impact mental health. Over recent years, psychologists have found that consistently using social platforms, especially among younger users, is associated with poor mental health. In fact, a study carried out by the University of Pittsburgh found that frequent social media users were three times more likely to be depressed than occasional users, three times more. It's thought that lifestyle implications like lack of sleep, as well as personal comparison, and online bullying all contribute to this. Recent social media occurrences really exemplify this. I'm sure lots of us have heard about famous grime artist and rapper Wiley, who shared anti-Semitic comments on Twitter, which sparked public outrage. There was a subsequent no safe space for Jew hate hashtag, which trended and a boycott of the platform. All of this really goes to show how easily hateful speech can spread online and the initial inaction by the platforms themselves to do much about it. But social media, despite its risks, does have its place in modern society and can offer many positives for users too. Hopefully, all of us here offer spaces of inspiration, encouragement and information to people which we hope will work to make the world a better place for animals. So if social media is sticking around, how can we utilize it in a way that doesn't contribute to anyone's negative experiences? Sarah Hughes, Chief Executive at the Center for Mental Health recognizes, social media use is fundamental to many of our lives today and particularly those of young people. So we need a new start that starts with the experiences of our audiences that understands the context in which social media exists in people's lives and that seeks solutions which will make a difference. So solutions, what are they? It's an increasingly repeated mantra nowadays that we should unfollow toxic accounts. If an account you follow doesn't inspire you, you should unfollow it. Don't waste your time there. We don't ever want the Humane League UK to be the account that someone new comes across and feels attacked by, or the account that offers little more than guilt tripping of individuals who aren't yet aware of the animal welfare issues. 
But before I go ahead and give you our top tips, I would like to just take a moment to be really honest with you all. The Humane UK and myself personally are still really trying to work all of this out. I'm not 100% sure how to best be inclusive all of the time, and I'm sure that I will make mistakes as I go along. It's a constant work in progress, something hopefully all of you can relate to too. However, while we continue to learn, our strategy for ensuring our social media platforms are a safer space for our users can be summed up in five main points. Number one, a zero tolerance for explicit or hateful comments. We recommend that you use your settings to automatically filter profane or hateful language from comments and moderate regularly to keep an eye on the interactions happening on your page. This should stop anyone seeing anything especially upsetting or personal in the comments. Um, I have to say it can also be quite difficult to decide what you count as hateful or explicit. Um, there are recommendations and suggestions available online and from the platforms themselves, but I would recommend reviewing what your organisation thinks is inappropriate or the kind of thing that your particular supporters might have an issue with reading and then take this into consideration when moderating. Number two. Sorry, one second, I've just lost my place. There we go. Apologies. Number two is carefully considering language use to be as inclusive as possible. So it's quite hard to think of an example where the kind of content the Humane UK posts would be explicitly hateful, but there are many ways that we might be prone to excluding certain groups. For example, mainstream veganism stereotypically tends to be fairly white and middle class. So when creating content and writing copy, we must consider ways in which our feed might appear to be too cliquey. Is our content coming across as ableist? Are we ignoring religious or cultural considerations surrounding plant-based diets? Are we amplifying vegans of colour? Are we considering different economic factors and different people's financial capacities? The more welcoming we can make our pages for everyone, the more we can let people know. We hear you, we see you, and you are welcome in our community of animal lovers. Number three. It might seem a bit obvious, but number three is keeping content kind when it comes to our supporters or new people viewing our social media pages. We want to bring new supporters in, not scare them off from the get go. So even when sharing graphic content about animal suffering, we'd like to make sure that it doesn't appear to attack any individuals. So if we're sharing content relating to the dairy industry, we would want to keep it encouraging and inspirational and helpful to people who might be dairy milk drinkers rather than implicating them as individuals. Adding content warnings is another way to ensure content doesn't make anyone discovering your content feel unfairly attacked or unprepared for anything. Number four is one that I particularly like, and that's rewarding positive dialogue and community building. When we see people sharing information, stories, advice, and generally engaging with each other on our platforms in a positive, inclusive way, we like to recognise it. Whether it's reacting to the comments with a love heart or joining in the conversation, it creates a sense that this is the kind of conversation to be had on our pages. And finally, I recommend working with others to really monitor social media generally. As I mentioned before, we've recently joined this coalition where we can stay up to date with and make recommendations on ways to improve. And it's also really important to generally be on the ball when it comes to hate trends or what's going on in society generally that might transfer onto social so that you can be prepared to act on them. 
And our approach to community building and creating a positive online space seems to be working. On Instagram, for example, the industry benchmark for engagement rates is about 1.75% and ours is over 10%. I say this because I want you to be reassured that being kind doesn't have to come at the cost of effectiveness. So having touched on how we can work to ensure social is a safer space for our followers, I would also like to speak to how important this is for moderators as well. Those who work in comms are often on the, the front line of the charity or organisation. We're the ones opening up and reading critical messages, moderating profane comments and responding directly to the haters. It can be emotionally taxing. Earlier this year, Facebook agreed in principle to pay $52 million to compensate current and former content moderators who developed mental health issues on the job. The settlement covers more than 11,000 moderators who developed depression, PTSD, addictions and other mental health issues while moderating content on Facebook. Working in animal rights and animal welfare, I imagine that most of us here have seen our fair share of upsetting graphic content and that can just become part of the everyday job. The emotional toll of this combined with the hateful comments or inboxes which are criticizing you and that you have to respond to, that can really build up. Indeed, critical comments can start to feel personal. When I'm reading comments saying that we're holding hands with murderers and working in a way that's contrary to veganism, it's easy to feel emotional. I consider myself an impassioned vegan and being questioned on my ethics can be challenging, even if I know that the commenter doesn't know me directly as the face behind the screen. With the example I shared earlier, where someone commented on our Greg's post saying, you should be ashamed. You do have to be relentless and develop a bit of a thick skin in this work. Um, but I think we need to remember that we are all human and it's natural to be upset by comments like this. So how do we cope? I understand that it's part of my job role to be the one who deals with these, but it's still so important to share your feelings and experiences with others. If I'm feeling especially drained after a heavy load of trolling, I'll share my feelings with my manager, try and make light of it, and just remember that we're always stronger together and when we make sure we're checking in with ourselves. At the Humane League UK, we have weekly departmental meetings to check in on how we found the week, as well as wellbeing reflection sessions where we can share any difficulties or learnings from what we've just experienced. These kind of open spaces to discuss feelings are such an invaluable forum for getting support and sharing the load. Finally, I think it does again come back to knowing when to stop engaging with haters. If it's a repetitive negativity that's not going anywhere, you might be better to focus your attention on things that feel productive and hopeful. And while we should try and remain compassionate, don't waste your energy on people who aren't showing you the same compassion. So I realise I've given quite a lot of anecdotal evidence as to why compassionate communication is important, but does it really work in getting people on side? Psychologists have long established that unconstructive criticism doesn't motivate pro-social behaviours. It fuels social withdrawal and low self-esteem. So when you research how to influence others, to going vegan or getting them to support animal welfare, the suggestions never include preaching, shaming or mocking. The Vegan Society encourages open communication and honesty about your own journey, compassion, support, so giving people the tools they need to give plant-based or supporting the charity a go. It's also so important to genuinely listen to someone else's point of view. Put yourself in their shoes and acknowledge the ways you can relate to this person so you can build rapport. 
Likewise, the vegan strategist says, I don't like to think in terms of convincing or converting others. In the end, we can't make other people do anything, but we can influence them in the right direction and help them to open their minds and hearts. He recommends adapting your approach to the person in front of you, avoiding making rigid all or nothing asks, and suggests that once you've had your conversation, be patient. We all accept change at different paces and all progress should be celebrated, even if it's not happening as quickly as you would like. The likelihood of changing a belief someone has held for years in one conversation is pretty unlikely. So a more realistic strategy might be to explain how the issues can be accommodated into their existing worldview. Try and integrate your ideals into their current situations. A trivial example would be giving an avid steak eater all the best recipes and alternatives. Another point to consider is that much as we as experts in animal protection might be equipped with all the facts to support our mission, logic isn't always the best way to persuade people. People tend to um, conf confuse familiarity with knowledge and even when we do have knowledge, it's selective. We remember the things that fit in with our life view and we forget the others. So what we need to do is fill people's knowledge gaps with convincing, relatable stories, something almost impossible to achieve without compassion factoring into the equation. David Robson, a science writer specializing in the extremes of the human brain and behavior, also suggests that people are more rational and more willing to own up to the limits of their knowledge if they're treated with respect and compassion. He writes, aggression leads them to feel that their identity is threatened, which in turn can make them closed minded. He goes on to say, assuming that the purpose of your argument is to change minds rather than to signal your own superiority, you are much more likely to achieve your aims by arguing gently and kindly rather than belligerently and affirming your respect for the person. There's also evidence that this kind of compassionate communication benefits an organization's reputation generally. Psychologist Dr. Joe Vitriol says that there's a lot of work showing that third party observers always attribute high levels of competence when the person is conducting themselves with more civility. Sorry, Lauren, uh, we have uh, questions. Do you have time for questions? Yeah, we're super near the end. If are we to whiz through. We have five questions at Slido. Do you have any slides in your presentation? Do I have what, sorry? Uh, we have uh, questions and a Q&A session on the, mm -hmm. on the end. And we have 10 minutes so if you don't have so much to say or you have <laughs> i there's a couple of slides left so i mm -hmm. can whiz through them if yeah, that's okay okay, yeah, okay. yes Let's cool. do this. thank you so i will try and go a little quicker now for everyone but to conclude really the evidence is compelling compassion and communications creating safer online spaces and even loving the haters is an effective tool. There's a nice quote here by Lady Mary Wortley Montague from the 18th century, which still is so relevant now. And that's that civility, civility costs nothing and buys everything. So I'll just whiz through the final top tips. Remember your mission and how best to achieve it. What do you hope to achieve? Question whether your comms line up with your values. How do you want to present to the public? Keep a spreadsheet with FAQs or common criticisms and standard responses to save you time and effort. Utilize tools that are already in place, such as filters, block people if you need to. Share your experiences and seek help, whether it's venting to your best friend or creating a structure at work to help you deal with this. And my final point, I'd like to remind you that haters do come in all shapes and sizes, whether it's newly vegan me outside Bristol Zoo, Phil criticising the fish content, Maureen, Ashley, 
or an avid animal lover who doesn't want us to talk about Black Lives Matter. We really have to understand the place where each of us is coming from so that we can realize we're not the haters we thought, but just people with a lot of passion. So let's do all we can to nurture that passion into something communal, productive, and with awesome impact for the animals. And I can just leave you on this last slide, which is some of my favorite comments we've received recently, which show that social media can actually be a nice, wholesome place. Um, I just would like to finally say that as people on the forefront of the animal rights movement, we're all experts in cruelty and suffering. And although we might go about the way we want to help the animals in a different way, we're all seeking a kinder society. This has to start with the way we treat ourselves, the way we care for our supporters, and even the way we treat the haters. So if you want a more compassionate world, let's just implement that in our communications and make it happen. Sorry to have to have rushed that, um, but yeah, hopefully there's a couple of minutes for any questions. And I also have my email on the end if we don't have time and yeah, please feel free to email any questions that we don't cover. Okay, we, we can start with questions. Mm -hmm. It's okay for you? Yeah. Uh, okay, the first one is from Anya. How do you feel about deleting, hiding comments that are, for example, disrespectful? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's difficult to answer because it's so situational. I tend to be reluctant to delete comments because that alerts the person that they've been deleted or blocked or whatever. I'm much more likely to hide a comment. This tends to be more, um, we get a lot of really passionate animal advocates who will use quite strong language to describe companies or farmers or things like this. And we don't want to have that kind of profane language on our page, but this person is also not trying to be too negative. They're kind of just expressing emotions, which our posts probably encourage. So I'm much more comfortable hiding comments and I would be more likely to delete them if it was a case of kind of continued negativity or more specific abuse, especially if it was targeting other supporters. I think there's a bit of a line to be drawn there. Yeah, it's, uh, it's okay, I think. Um, another one is, what do you think will be the worldwide effect of asking people to reduce the demand for meat and dairy products? Will it increase sustainable production? Um, that's a big question. Um, I guess from kind of our stance of where we are, what we want is to improve welfare for animals while advocating on an individual basis for people to completely move away from animal products. In doing that, what we can achieve is hopefully less animals being consumed generally, which is really good for sustainability. And it's kind of tricky because obviously the more intensive the farming, um, the less and it's kind of almost weirdly more energy efficient because you're just cramming all the animals in. But for us, we hope that the idea of better welfare goes hand in hand with reducing your intake of animal products so that ultimately it balances out so that animals are suffering less. And overall, it's much more sustainable for the planet and for people generally. We have um, some good resources on our website covering this type of thing that might be interesting for people to read. The website link is on the slide that's up now in case I've kind of really <laughs> rushed over that answer. Okay, so I don't know, we have uh, maybe one, two minutes and there are uh, much more questions. Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, just another one. Uh, can you give examples of inclusive language that is worth using in our posts? I think that you give examples in your presentation here. And, sorry, examples of inclusive language to use. That is, is worth using in our posts. Yeah, um, that's again kind of a hugely broad thing, but if you look at different areas that you can be inclusive, it can be anything from 
taking account of non-binary individuals so not assuming people's gender don't always refer to individuals as he or she if you don't know it can be if you are promoting a fundraiser um, don't make it exclusive to people who can go out and do a run because that's excluding anyone who might be less abled in some way or in a wheelchair or things like that um, there are so many kind of examples of this and if anyone would like more advice please feel free to email me it's also things like I remember when I first started working here I wanted to post something with a goat saying it was saying how goats love pasta and I wanted to say that goats were my spirit guide or my spirit animal or something like this and then I realized actually that's kind of culturally sensitive and not really appropriate for me to use in this context. Um, I think it's always a learning curve. And again, I'm sure I'll make mistakes in my comms. Um, but yeah, there's lots of little things that you can really integrate. And just whenever you're writing copy, I would think pass it on to people who are different from you to get a different perspective. Um, just think about people that aren't your typical audience and how they might feel if they read that post, like how might they be excluded by the language you're using? Okay, okay, uh, super, thank you.